I've never been in pain before. This is the worst pain I've ever been to and I need drugs. I need drugs so bad, like I didn't know what was going on. Christina Vithoukas, an absolutely inspiring and courageous creator out there on the internet. You can't let someone else project it and you can't let someone else write your story. Aiming to become a role model for her followers, despite that day. So talk to us about that day, Christina. Day of the accident, I honestly, like I don't remember the accident. I didn't feel comfortable that day and I shouldn't have hit the ramp. Back wheel hit the top of the deck, like my feet flung up and I landed on my head and my butt came back and hit me in the back of the head. So I scorpioned, like I fall flat in half. I had broke T5, 6, 7, lacerated my spleen, fractured my skull. How my sister describes what was happening, she goes, you just kept saying to everyone. Today's guest embodies resilience and strength a testament to the human spirit's ability to overcome the most daunting challenges. Born a daredevil, she embraced the thrilling world of motocross, only to face a life-altering moment that transformed her journey in the most unimaginable way. After a severe accident that left her paralysed, she didn't succumb to despair. Instead, she found new passions, redefining her life with remarkable courage and an unwavering positive outlook. From motocross tracks to the inspiring world of public speaking and advocating for spinal cord research, her story is a powerful narrative of determination, hope and the incredible capacity to adapt and thrive against all odds. Welcome to the pod, the legend that is Christina Vithulkas. And don't forget, if you're interested in growing well through townhouse development, check out the Little Fish Network. You get coaching, expert access, and community support. It's essentially everything you need to win at property and development. For 20% discount, use the code POD20. See you in there. Welcome back to Australia's number one podcast. We have a little fish and we speak to the big fish about town each and every week. Please like, share, subscribe, follow all that sort of stuff. 2024, we're donating $1 for every every uh, follow and subscribe to our amazing charity EB, which is Bryce is going to Bryce is going to do this one. Oh, I'll throw what's, it out. What's, what's the name <laughs> of our charity, <laughs> boss? Epi- yeah. ep- epidermalosis uh, bellosa. Oh, well done, bang, boss. Bang, bang. It's, it's great when we get a bit of education oh, on no, the podcast. How good is he? There, there was no warning on that either. I just noticed. No. Oh, mate, we prepped you for days. For that. No, I'm <laughs> no, well done, mate. Thank you. And please, a dollar every time you subscribe or follow, that is free. Press that button. Or there's a link below where you can make a donation. Um, it is the disease, the worst disease that we've that you've never heard about. Uh, it's a skin disease, rare skin disease that is in uh, our most vulnerable, our children. So please get around it and smash the follow and, and subscribe button. And everyone that has so far, we really appreciate it as well because it is, it is, yeah, legends. Because it's a, it's a cause that's in desperate need, and it's genuinely like it's, it's almost like it's a secret. So we're trying to change that. So yeah, with your help. So thank you. Spot on, Benny. Thank you very much. Uh, Christina, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me on Australia's number one podcast. Oh. I feel honoured. <laughs> Instantly our favourite guest. Um, <laughs> just, a, just, just a quick one. Uh, it's, uh, you know, obviously in the intro, people now know you. Um, you know, you know, you had your accident, that sort of stuff. When you got here today, you parked out the back, jumped out of your car, um, into your chair, Brucey, Big MB. Carried you up the stairs. It was quite amazing. Uh, and you're so, oh, you're just so full of life and sort of easy going with that sort of stuff. It was, yeah, it's been amazing the half an hour that you've already been here. Yeah, well, I'm alive, so I make the most of it while I'm here. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Love that, love that outlook. Christina, can we go back to the Christina before before the accident? Like, you're so full of beans right now. I feel like you're taking on the world. You know, we, we have people in here with... Um, you know, that are, that are more fortunate physically uh, that don't have the outlook you seem to have. You know, who, who, who was Christina like before, before the accident? I think that's an awesome question because with my disability and everything that I've gone through, I feel like a lot of people are like, surely, you know, she didn't just wake up and have this attitude. And I feel like growing up now, looking back at it, and when I reflect on my childhood, I'm like, everything makes sense because I feel like from a young child... Growing up in rural South Australia, in Barmara, so real country town, two and a half hours from Adelaide, uh, with a twin sister, my dad on a 20-acre vineyard growing grapes, my mum a deputy principal at a primary school, and 
our core values and, you know, just everything my dad embedded into my brain. And when I say embedded, like, I mean, nailed it into my brain every single day. Like glass is always half full. Yeah. It's just, it's easy to look back and be like, yeah, okay. That makes sense. Why everything since my accident has just been a breeze. My childhood was, you know, just traveling and family time and quality over quantity. You know, we didn't have the best house in our family out of all the cousins and stuff. But, you know, everyone would be coming to our house for parties and weekends because my dad seen the value in entertaining people, making people feel comfortable, making sure people had food, unlimited drinks. And it was just everything he and my mum valued just seemed to be quite the opposite for most people. Like we, dad would make us drive to school in the Datsun 180B, which I think is pretty cool now. Yeah, that's the that mean. That yeah, 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 as, as, as like a, you know, 10-year-old <laughs> girl. What colour was it? It was white. Oh, yes. Yeah, right. And, but it was not maintained. So it wasn't a maintained one. But like, you know, like now I'm into cars, so I appreciate it. But back then, like, you know, like we'll uh, we'll drive to school in that. And I'll be like, oh my God, dad, like, why can't we drive like another car and stuff? And dad would just be like, like material things are like, disposable like you know you don't always have him and he would be like the value that he would get from us being embarrassed in the car was like priceless to him and like as a kid I couldn't see that but as an adult looking back I'm like I'm just so glad I had an upbringing where dad and my mum didn't care about the materialistic stuff we had a um uh we had what's that floor the vinyl flooring in the kitchen and it had a cut all the way through it we had duct tape on it we had <laughs> just we had an outside toilet we had all like nothing materialistic but we would travel every year every year would go overseas I went to 23 countries by the time I was 18 like dad would like not care about materialistic stuff and just put the value into memories and being happy and educating and I think now when I look at it and reflecting as a 28 year old I'm like everything makes sense now <laughs> I think your childhood does play a big role in it so yeah. How, how important, you know, you, your father sounds like an amazing man. and I've heard about him for all of 30 <laughs> seconds. How important was were those early lessons of enjoying, sounds like enjoying the moment, being grateful, appreciative for what you've got. How important was that in your childhood, um, you know, I based think, on what's happened since? I think it was so important. Like uh, the day he picked, me, picked us up in the one, uh, sorry, the Datsun 180B, that was picking us up. But going to school... He made us walk every single day. It was a, about 1,500 metres uh, walk. No, about three kilometres actually, I would say, not 1,500 metres. But he would make us walk in the rain, in the cold. would have people pull up next to us and be like, hey, guys, you need a lift. And I was like, no, the girls are walking to school. Cause he would, and he would say this every single walk. He would say, one day this is going to be a memory. He goes, one day you girls are going to grow up and all I'm going to have is a memory to look back at. And he goes, I'm not... I need to make sure that I use like this opportunity to appreciate the moment while you girls are kids. Cause one day you're not going to live at home, even though I did go back home for a little while. But um, now looking back at that, I'm like, it was so important because I seen, and I was able to treasure moments with people and how these moments make me feel compared to how other people are like probably just too busy worrying about the paycheck or getting their kids to school quick enough. When my dad was like, I'm going to, stay home um well I mean he his job was at home but like one once we got home he did he would complain about making Irene and I toast every day after school even when we were in high school we never grew up we always had toast after school as a snack and dad would always make like complain about it and then would have to remind him like dad one day you're not going to make us toast so <laughs> as a 28 year old when I go back home dad's like do you want toast and you, like I don't know I think like I've been able to witness it and it was really important like another thing I feel like that has been really embedded into my brain was I can't I probably cannot count the amount of times my dad would say because we spent a lot of time with dad he was like the stay-at-home mum um he would say to us like you have no idea how lucky you are that we have been able to go to the supermarket fill up a trolley and go back to a house with a roof over our heads and he would say that every time we go shop like I don't know if my dad has dementia or if he just <laughs> repeat. Like he just would first repeat. Dates. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know what? I've got early onset dementia now, so I'm turning into my dad. But the way I see it, I'm like, 
now as an adult, I'm like, oh my God, those were affirmations without even knowing it. Uh-huh. But he would do it all the time. And because it's out loud and because you would always say it, you you get to a point where you say it so much. You know how they say, fake it till you believe it. And I believe with affirmations, I'm not sure if you guys are into that stuff or do that. I've done affirmations out loud once in my life. That's another story, but basically that's how I got my boyfriend. Anyways, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that doing that over and over time, you get to a point where you actually just believe it and it's just in your blood. And so when the injury came, I was just like, people are looking at me like the worst thing has ever, happened to me and I was like I'm alive like I am the richest person in this room I've got all my family members coming and visiting me like I couldn't even think of one thing to complain about and that and that was off the bat that was oh, off the bat off the bat because I've explained this before I feel like this is the only way it's the only analogy I think can explain it like um I I don't know. I think I must just talk a lot to myself in my head. I think it's the ADHD thing. And I, as a, even as a young kid, I would, dad would do it as well. Like, you know, put us in other people's positions and dad would be like, you know, like if you have road rage or if something happens, because you don't know what that person's ha- had happened to them this morning. You don't know if someone, you know, has died or if they just lost their job and dad would always say things. So as, as a, you know, young child, I'd always put myself, I don't know if that's like an empath thing as well, put myself in other, like other people's positions. But it would also get me questioning why people have different perspectives or do things differently. And with my injury, when that happened, I just realised, like I was like, everyone, this sounds so cheesy, but it's just true to me. I believe that everyone has the control of their own life and to write their story however they want it no matter how bad it looks to someone else because when I think of like kids in Africa that are dying and don't have toys to play with yet they look so happy and don't even know what depression is I would sit there and think people in this room have been conditioned their whole life having all the materialistic stuff all everything going easy for them and yet when they find themselves in a position where they lose the ability to walk or something all of a sudden that's a bad thing and in my head I was like well I'm able to look at it and just change that conditioned way of thinking and turn it into the best thing that ever happened to me and I think like I've explained before like you know when we go to an overseas country and you see a green light you'll know that's go and the only reason you know that is because you've been conditioned your whole life green is go red is stop with my injury I was like everyone's been conditioned to see paralyzed red light and I was like, well, I'm, sweeping, uh, I'm swapping it over. It's a green light for me. And I'll just rewrite my story the way I want it. Wow. Christina, that, that, that is remarkable. And you, you could see, like, if you fast forward to now and you get to reflect on that, you could see how that would be quite, um, you know, a sign of resilience and you uh, getting the right perspective. But to do that from the beginning, um, from me, from an outside um, observer, that, that seems... That seems the most incredible part because um sure you know you're alive and there's lots to be thankful for but but that is a significant life event and you've just gone no i i so this this influence that your dad has had he said he does sound like a remarkable man Um, you need him on the podcast (laughs) (laughs) book him in (laughs) but but um you would have been forgiven for a couple of days just to um just to go wow this is this is seriously significant i've got every right to be negative yeah, but I don't know if this is the stubbornness in me. I don't see the point. Like if I'm going to do a diet and try to cut out sugar and stuff, I don't cheat. I don't cheat my diet. If I'm going to do it, I do it properly. If I'm going to spend even one hour thinking about complaining about it, I'm like, in my head, I'm like, what is the point? Because I'm going to get over it and I'm going to move on. So I'm not even going to waste it. I do understand though, like, because I don't even take my own advice on other situations in my life. I'll let other things in my life, surprisingly, bother me. And I'm getting mad. For example? For example? Oh, oh, hold on. Let me think. I shouldn't say this, but TAC, because I'm covered by TAC. And surprisingly, like I say this to everyone, I have never cried and been so upset, distressed, anxiety, because of a outside source like TAC who are supposed to be there to help me. I'm like, my injury doesn't even bother me. I don't even get phased. I'll have a UTI and I piss myself in the bed. 
this is a couple years ago when I was getting them frequently for three months. And I, that wouldn't even bother me and upset me. My dad would even say, he's like, are you sure? Like, are you, are you okay? Like, does it bother you? And I'm like, no, I'm, like, that, I'm alive. Like, if I piss myself, that's my body doing what it has to do to keep me alive. How can I be mad about that? But TAC not doing their job <laughs> and annoying me. Yeah, TAC. It's a big, it's a big um, rap for TAC. Oh, TAC, TAC, TAC. Yeah. Oh, that's how good they're going. But it's just, yeah, but... It's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. So tell us a bit more about dad's backstory. He, ha, when, when did he arrive in Australia? How did he end up in a remote um, rural town in what's on the border of Victoria, but you're in South Barmer, Australia? Yeah, in the Riverland. Um, so dad and mum were both born here. It was our grandparents. Ah. They came over from Greece. Um, I don't even think if one, I think was on boat, one was by plane. Um, and they, our grandparents came over from Greece, actually started off in Queensland with the sugarcane fields. And then they somehow decided to go to the Riverland, which I'm thankful for because now after living in Melbourne for a little while, I'm like, you know what? I appreciate the Riverland and the beautiful weather. Um, they, yeah, went to the vineyards, I guess, back then with any um, immigrants. They just went to block work or like physical labor. And yeah, and dad, I'm not too sure where my dad's got this from, but I, it might have been from my grandma. I think she's an absolute saint. My grandma apparently never ever in her life got mad never like raised a voice my dad would like roll in a pile of mud right before a wedding in a brand new tuxedo and she would be like come on Jim and like just not raise her voice and like when I look back at it she passed away like many years ago but I think dad having such a saint of a mother never letting things bother her and just like I think as well having the the immigrants back then just being able to appreciate food on the table mm. and being in a different country and having like an opportunity, maybe that's what, yeah, came about with my dad. Because it seems like that's the foundation for your response to what's happened, right? So, the, mm. and, it, and it's kind of a lesson for everyone who's watching this or listening to this to go, some of those foundational things really matter. So I've got two boys, one's 10, 12. I, when I catch myself um, saying things that I, that I said I'd never say that my parents said, um, I'm actively trying to program them in where your mind goes, your body follows. Where, yeah. you, where your focus goes, your energy follows. So just these little things, knowing how powerful mm -hmm. some of these things are. But you're, you're, a, you're an extreme example of how, how incredibly powerful some of these um, you know, conditioning conversations that your dad's having. Damn straight you walk to school. Even if it's raining, tell the cars not to come and pick I you think, up. Yeah, when you said the word extreme... Uh, and in my head, I'm like, my dad is extreme. Like, <laughs> he, like, every day, like, I don't think people could believe it, but it's like every, I, my memory of my childhood is me and Irene going, yes, dad, yeah. Like, I think we said that so many times because dad would just say it over and over again. And now that when I look at it, the only conclusion I've come to is affirmations and being able to repeat it to a point where your child has no other option other than to believe you. And I think you, as a parent, mm. like, you have that big influence. They look up to you and, you know, I believe like the five, you know how they say like the top five people you mm. spend the most time with is who you are at that age. I know they have school and stuff, but you are one of their top five. So you have the biggest influence on them and you have the opportunity. And I think anyone listening that might feel like they haven't, you know, done as much as they want. Like it's not too late. You can start now and just try that little bit, like have that little conversation here and there, uncomfortable conversations, but it's important. Like, mm. Yeah, I think it's enormously beneficial. Oh, amazing. Christina, so you got into bikes at a young age? Not really. I no? actually, surprisingly enough, I never rode a dirt bike until I was 19. And then when I got in the back of an X's, I was just like, I need my own. I don't want him to control it. I want to drive it, ride it. Um, and I got my own. I did though, like again, another reflection I was doing recently, I was like, Everything kind of makes sense now. When I look at my childhood, my twin sister and I would race home, run to the quad bike. We used to have a four-wheeler quad and just jump on that. We'll go to the end of the block, wait for a semi-truck, to because we, li we lived on the highway, <laughs> wait for a semi-truck to come around this bend and we would drag it down our block. <laughs> and, and now when I think of it, I'm like, I'm into drift. I have a drift car now, high adrenaline sports, in a wheelchair. Like, hey, it all makes sense. It was bound to happen. Um, but yeah, so I was 19 years old. I fell in love with motorbikes. I never had a passion. I envied, envied anyone that had a passion, especially because we were in the Riverland. Everyone played sports, netball, football, or 
they at least were like wakeboarding or something. And I just envied people that had something that they could just go hard at. And I never had that because I think I just had my family. Like that was enough for me. Um, and then when I got in the back of a bike, I was like, oh, like no wonder I've never like been into team sports and stuff. Like I need like a motor. Um, so I got, <laughs> I got a, a bike literally two weeks after um, hopping on a bike for the first time, rode that took about a year before I was like, all right, grew the balls to actually start racing. Even though I was like the slowest one out there, I got to a point where I was like, well, I'm too old. Like, I could use my age as an excuse not to be good because these girls that I was competing against had been riding their whole life. I was like, well, it doesn't matter if I come last. Like, what do you expect? Like, I've been on a bike for a year. So I started racing and then started doing state title rounds just because I didn't want to miss a day on riding. And that's like, like they told me, like, Christina, like the tracks are going to be closed on Sunday for racing I was like all right fine I'll race <laughs> started racing and uh started hitting freestyle motocross jumps so like the nitro circus yeah. boys where they have like a metal ramp and a gap yeah, we had Cam uh, uh, Sinclair, Sinclair. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah I actually did it sorry Cam I didn't listen to you I was, I'm gonna listen to his next <laughs> well, I, I know sorry, Cam. yeah I know Cam um yeah so they hit a 75 foot gap I hit a 55 foot gap so 20 feet shorter 17 meter gap so I started doing that. So you were doing, you were hitting them. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. That's how I had my accident. <laughs> yeah. How do you think I ended no, up in no, the wheelchair? No, I did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now we weren't sure if you were mastering it or, oh, yeah, or, yeah. or the accident happened trying to. Oh no, be no, good sorry, at sorry, it, sorry, sorry, I mean? no, no. I was definitely not a master. That's why I'm in the wheelchair. <laughs> well, right. fifty-five no. feet sounds reasonable. Oh, to me. Uh, yeah. I was, yeah. I my mentality, I guess, was just like, if the boys can do it, I can do it. Mm. Like I, I think everything. I think that this. Uh, also is a testament to my like attitude I think everything comes to the mind and I'm like guys have some I don't know some screws loose in their head <laughs> and just don't care as much as females and don't do that like risk factor check um and I was like okay if the boys can do it I can do it there's, there's no difference there's, they've got two arms two legs like I can do the same thing and I was yeah just hitting ramps trying to like catch up to everyone because I felt like I lost all that in my childhood never um yeah growing up with it but then like looking back at it i was like oh i was actually doing bigger jumps than guys their whole life that had been riding hadn't even been hit so i was like yeah so so talk talk to us about that day christina yes yeah, so the, the crash day of the accident i was back at home in the riverland uh yeah sorry i was back at home in the riverland visiting my family um and i honestly like i don't remember the accident because I was knocked out like pretty hard. I fractured my skull, but I do remember like, I just didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel comfortable that day and I shouldn't have hit the ramp. I know I shouldn't have, but I'm so stubborn that I have like a three speed check rule. So once I line up the jump and I check it once, I'm like, okay, you got to do three speed checks and then you just got to hit it. And even though I didn't feel comfortable, I did the three speed checks. I was like, too late. You have to hit it now. I hit it. I remember knowing that it wasn't going to end well. Like I, I just knew I'm like, fuck, I haven't like gone hard enough. Um, and by the way, this was a, a jump that I hadn't hit before. So like there was a lot going on. I wasn't feeling comfortable and I, no excuses though. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I jumped, I came short from what my sister has said because she actually witnessed it. My twin who never watches me ride. She was never, was never around it. She was actually there that day. She seen, I came short, the back wheel hit the top of the deck, which basically made myself and the bike bounce. But I then, like my feet flung up and I landed on my head and my butt came back and hit me in the back of the head. So I scorpioned, like I fall flat in half. They heard the snap. They seen it. I can't remember any of it. Um, They ran over to me. Actually, it's crazy because I don't... I never really go back to my accident other than like when I describe it like this, I don't actually go down to the details. And I actually rang my sister the other week and I said, Hey, like how long was I actually out for? Cause I don't, I don't actually even know. And she goes, by the time we ran over to you, you were still unconscious. I had broke T5, six, seven, lacerated my spleen, fractured my skull, which I actually didn't learn about till two years later, but it makes sense. Cause I get headaches all the time. Fractured my skull. Um, I think that's actually pretty good considering. I mean, I did a big job with that one, but that was my first bone I broke. I, I would have been in a lot worse position if I broke my arms and stuff. Um, 
And my sister said I was unconscious. She goes, you definitely weren't awake for three minutes. And she, it took you about five minutes to come to. Now, when I came to, I remember just like, I, it was just, I've never been in pain before. Like, and I don't, I don't know why I thought of pregnancy or whatever, but I was just like, this has to be worse. Like, this must be the worst. Because I, all my life I was like scared of like ever giving birth and like having my vagina stretched. But like this, I, was, I remember thinking there and going, F- this is the worst pain I've ever been to and I need drugs. Like I've never had the green whistle, but I was like, I need drugs so bad. Like I didn't know what was going on. How my sister um, describes what was happening, she goes... Um, you just kept saying to everyone, which I now know what was, it was, um, I was in spinal shock, but apparently I kept telling everyone, like, can you put my legs down? And I kept saying, like, put my legs down, put my legs down. And they knew for themselves, like, she's paralyzed. Like, she can't feel her legs because her legs are dead flat on the ground. And I kept saying, like, just put my legs down, put my legs down. And apparently, um, Irene says, when we basically knew that I was paralyzed, because someone went down to my legs and they're like, can you feel this? Can you feel that? And I could see at the bottom of my eyes, they were down at my legs and I knew I'm like, I can't feel it. I didn't really care at the time because I was just in so much pain. But Irene reckons that, you know, when you're about to cry and you're like, your chin kind of like. Starts to quiver. Yeah. She reckons I did that. And she goes, you could tell you did that. She goes, and then you just stopped. She goes, you didn't, she goes, you didn't even cry. She And she, I can't remember because I got so drugged up. I had like so much ketamine after that from the Ambos. But she reckons, she goes, it's like you could tell you just like accepted it. And you and I never cried since that about that. In that moment. Yeah. That is the craziest. Oh. Chris, Christina, how, how did Irene, your twin sister, how was it like for her? I've got twin boys. They're three. Oh. And, you, and you can see them building, you know, building a bond. And you're just like, the bond you get when you're circa 20 is mm. going to be crazy. Like, what was what was that that day like for her? And that took me a while to even, even consider. Like, I just was like, oh, this is fine. The injury was fine. I knew I had it handled. And I did. And I still do. But it took me a little while to, like, actually, like, understand from Irene's perspective what happened. Because like, I didn't even consider that. Like, I'm fine. But in hospital, everyone, like everyone would joke about everything. Like if we didn't know, everyone would think Irene was the one that paralyzed herself. <laughs> but she was crying and she was a mess. And, the po- and I, I laugh about it. But like when I think about it, I'm like, oh my God, like if it was the other way around, that would have killed me. And like poor Irene, I'm just sitting there on the ground thinking I want drugs while she's sitting thinking, how am I going to tell mum and dad? I didn't even think of that. And when I even think about it, I'm like, I get goosebumps. Imagine me having to make that phone call to mum and dad and say, mm. we don't know if Christina's going to make it. And that was another, you know, thing I didn't consider from her. But like I knew that when I woke up, it was actually the first time that I didn't know if I was going to make it. When I woke up, I was like, nothing mattered because I was like, am I even going to survive? I didn't even know that. And now to think, oh, shit, like imagine my sister going through that. Like, so to this day, like, it's not a touchy t- subject for her, but she, um, yeah, like it, it's definitely affected her way more than me. <laughs> and can, can we say for the record, what was your dad's name? Jim. Jimmy. Shout out, <laughs> Jimmy, legend. So can you talk, do you remember the moment when you first saw your dad and 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 how that went and how your dad took it? Because I'd imagine um, Irene would have taken it pretty tough, but your dad, uh, I'm tipping, have taken it pretty tough as well yeah you can actually um you can see it in photos if you like the photos i've uploaded from like hospital and stuff and you can see dad and mum just around my bed and you could just see the fake smile like they just look like they've just seen a ghost they are mortified they and they are like i remember being in hospital and dad and and apparent i didn't know this till later um but they would all cry once they left the room they would just like pull a straight face try to be strong Mm. for me which like i was like I am the backbone of this family and <laughs> my back's broken and I was like handling it way better than any of them. Um, but yeah, they were like trying to pull this sh- strong face and like, and I was like, I've got this handled. But dad and mum would come in. You could tell they were stressed. Mum was much more better at hiding it because yeah, she's just great at that. Um, but with my family and then, then I got the cousins and then I've got like, you know, the people you haven't seen in 10 years start pulling in and like wanting to see you. And I'm like... I could literally feel the energy of the room. I felt like I was on my deathbed. Like I was like, everyone's coming to say goodbye. But instead they're like saying hello. But I was like, 
do that. Like, they, I feel like everyone's just like grieving me right now. And I'm just sitting there like, I'm so happy I get to see my family. I haven't seen my cousins for like six months because I was living in Victoria at the time when I had the accident, but my hospital was in South Australia. So to me, it was just, yeah, they, they were mortified and it took them a while. And even to this day, I think I had a phone call with dad. Maybe this was, I mean, I spoke to him this morning, but maybe a couple of months ago. And he said, he said, he said this a couple of times and he'll say it to me. He goes, like, does any, anything frustrate you? Or, like you, you are okay. And I'm like, yes, dad, I'm fine. He goes, okay, I'm just double checking. Cause he gets people asking him like, mm. How is Christina actually going? Like, is she okay? So even Jim's tripping out going, how is yeah. this possible? <laughs> he, goes, he goes, it's just amazing. I hope you keep it up. Like, <laughs> And Jim's gone, geez, I have created a, a positive yeah. a po- a positive young girl. Think- did that Did that sort of somewhat somewhat drive you? Like, because that's the thing. After that accident, you sort of become the underdog. Mm. You know what I mean? You're the, you're the underdog and you've got everyone around you sort of going, you know, she's going to be up against it mm. for the rest of her life here. Is that... Is that something that you want to defy type thing? Yeah, Is like, that- or when I had friends of mine, close friends of mine, um, being telling me that they had other friends going like, you know, like once once it hits Christina, like she, it hasn't hit her yet. It's going to hit her. She seems great. She seems positive now. But like, you know, just got to, you know, be prepared for when, you know, the reality of it all um, hits her. And I just remember like stuff like that. And I just would drive me but like to prove a point. I'm like... You can't, you can't let someone else project, yeah. project it and you can't let someone else write your story. Like my disability was the perfect opportunity for me to prove that I was the only one that had the pen. Yeah, yes, you're I- the script writer. I believe, can I say something here? Yeah, yeah. We, when Bryce is obviously a, a, a guest host that floats in here, but we did a, first did an episode with Bryce and Bryce mm. told the story. If you do remember that, 100%. and he talked about being the script writer and the person up in the room that puts the script on and, and, the, and the film thing and, and having the control over that. I don't want to speak for you, Bryce, but do I, I do remember that because I feel like that's a lot of um, a lot of your story and it's a superpower to be able to, to recognize that other people are telling you how you should feel or how you should react and for you to have the strength and, and, the, and the poise to be able to go, no, 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 I'm the script writer. I, I get to write my own script and I don't feel that way. So yeah, I need to listen crazy. to that podcast. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. one of our best. You ones actually for sure. do, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because what what I said at the time is you are you are the script writer, not just the actor in your life, mm-hmm. right? So you get the pen and you get to write it, and I think that gets tested mm-hmm. in in your circumstances, right? And you are um, the living, breathing example of taking that to the next level. And I think um, what's what's remarkable about your your character is I I did some. I did some backstory before you came in. I needed to know who who we were dealing with. And if you were able to, on your socials and on your YouTube channel, if I was able to zoom in to frame out the Mm -hmm. chair, you're a larger than life personality. You you see, you you know, the glass is half full. That that comes across in spades, right? So just as a as a an interaction piece of um, seeing how any human exists, you are already. Um, in a in a class of your own, and then you add the layer that we've been talking about here. It's incredible. So I think I think if anyone is actually struggling to understand that concept that, that Benny was saying, you you get to choose. There are mm. there are stories of Viktor Frankl who was in a concentration camp where he only had his mind because everything else was taken away, and he got to choose that. And I guess um, you just relayed that story before, and I just. I just felt mm. so much in in that story, and um, um, I, I, you know, you you the reason that you're still here is for there's there's a lot of inspiration, and mm. there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of people that you get to to motivate and touch mm. uh, going forward. Is, is, how, what what do you see as as the reason why you're still getting this opportunity? As sorry, second, like you said, you're just happy that you're alive, right? Yeah. So, and I feel like. The injury and the the reason I always like when people like just they it baffles them when I say that I would never take back what I did that day. Like if I if I could go back in time, I would get back on that same bike and I would jump it. And they're so baffled. I'm like, I found my purpose. I found a reason to live, not reason to live, but like you know what I mean, like a bit dramatic. It gave you a but greater purpose, for, a greater reason. Yeah, and yeah. for example, I seen a TikTok the other day. I'm not sure if all of you have kids. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so yes, you're yes. all father. And so you would obviously relate to this. There's a TikTok and there was like a bit of a joke about, you know, not having kids. And in the comments in there, you get all the parents that are like, 
life doesn't start, you, you don't start living life until you have kids, which I'm sure you could all relate with. But in my head, I'm like, I read that and I completely appreciate and agree with that to some, um, to some point. But I feel like I got that purpose when I had my accident. So without the kids, I found my purpose, my reason to spread like kindness and inspiration. Uh, inspiration is so cheesy. But like... But that's what it I, is, yeah. But I love yeah. that, like how you want to be there for your sons and your kids and you want to be that, like you want to teach them, you want to give them as much value in this world. Like my dad would say that all the time. He goes, you know, he doesn't know how long he's going to be around for. So he wants to give us as much... Dude, you get to spread Jim's word. Yeah, that's exactly. the And that's the beauty. And, and, and I love it. I've got my daughter here and anyone that's followed the pod for any level of time know that she's always here. Because I, I'm the gym to her. Like yeah, I, I'm, love I feel like that's yeah. I feel like Jim cracked the code early on. It's not about things and stuff, and it's about experiences, and it's about feeding. The, it's about teaching them what you learn, and and changing the narrative so that they believe that they can be positive. They can take challenges. They mm-hmm. can have the resilience and stuff. It's an epic, epic story, and I, I genuinely believe, for me, like I'm a believer that things happen for a reason. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that you're, yeah, you're great. There's a reason why you had that accident today and that you're, you know, you're, you're just built different and you can go out and you can change people's lives because it's crazy when you sit on this side of the screen, you can forget how many people it goes out to and how many people really do, it does Benefit. like touch, do you know what I mean? And you say, if it helps one, it's worth it. Mm-hmm. But I can tell you now, like I, I've, you know, I was the one that reached out to you and stuff and cause I was blown away by your story and like, Bryce said I could see that positivity and stuff and it's yeah it's I, I think that's yeah I think that's your your superpower and your purpose and and you're doing an awesome and job 100% yeah I agree with the everything happens for a reason yeah so even like I'm the worst for it like I should take my own advice when I'm going through some like other life stresses I'm like my injury doesn't even bother me and I'll let like this little pathetic thing help, um, bother me and ruin my day but I like come back to it and I'm like everything happens for a reason nothing in my life has never w- not worked out and it might not look like to, yeah. that to other people but eventually you'll find the reasons why things happen and you can connect those dots yeah. right in yeah. hindsight you can go oh that dot went with that dot went to that dot mm-hmm. and that's how i ended up got getting yeah. here yeah it's, it's... i wouldn't be on the best podcast in australia right now <laughs> and because and like i said there's a, there's a lot of kids like there's a lot of and shout out podgy who i've mentioned here before and i, I spoke to you, one of my best mates who had a, a similar accident when we were about 20 and and he has definitely gone internal and you've gone external and i think yeah the more people like and podgy's happy don't get me wrong he's a happy dude and he's, he's, a, he's a legend but i think the more people that can you know if podgy had some more people like you out there when you know there was a different time back then as far as how things got shared and being able to look up to people but i think the more people out yeah looking at it giving a different narrative and a different perspective i think yeah it's, that's it's, it's what crazy. i needed in rehab so yeah. that's another drive Correct. behind so what happened was when i was in rehab just for example like even like when i was coming on this podcast i'm like right i need to research these guys <laughs> doing my studying with the injury it's it's a whole degree like it is you don't know and all i thought people in wheelchairs didn't their legs just didn't work i didn't understand anything else and then when I had my injuries, I was like, all right, learning all this stuff. And then I'm like, cool, now I need to see people pushing the limits and living their life. And I'm like online and I'm trying to find people. And the people I would find had their niche. That would be a Paralympian or Bruce Cook that I knew beforehand that does the, if you know Bruce Cook, that he does the paralyzed uh, backflips on the dirt bike for Nitro Circus. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I already knew him before my accident. So I already had an example of like, uh, hold on, like this is not going to stop <clears> me. <throat> But then in rehab, I was just like, I was looking and I was looking and I was like, okay, I found people with their little niches. So I had to follow a few people. And I was like, in a hospital, I was like, I want to be that person that someone that's just, just been paralyzed can be like, go to Christina's page and look at what she's doing. And just so they can look at it. Cause I feel like, you know how they say, you know, everything seems impossible until it's done. Mm. I want to be that example of like, she can do it. Just like your mate Podgy with social media back then, like, wasn't really a thing. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, exactly. I feel like if you can present it and you can show it and put it on display, people are like, okay, hold on, we can replicate it or at least try well, to. Because you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And you and as we've spoken about here today, we're influenced by who we're influenced. And when we were younger, you know, you're in a chair and it's almost like you said, everyone, you saw it mm-hmm. yourself when you were laying in the bed and people were coming in, you felt like they were almost like mourning you mm-hmm. because that's what we're, you know, we're led conditioned. to. Conditioned. Yeah. So my, my, I do have a question like, 
I'm sure like it all, you know, there's, we've spoken about a lot of the positives and your mindset and attitude is, is, is insane or incredible, I should say, insanely incredible. <laughs> uh, but there has to have been some challenges and uh, along the way and adjustments that you've need to make and, and not necessarily negative, but what, what are some of those challenges that you had to, that became reality and, and, and adjustments or some of the biggest challenges and adjustments you had you yeah, to make? Definitely. Surely something gave you the yeah, shits. There, well, Give us n- something. Not the shits made me cry <laughs> and got upset a morning pr- putting on skinny leg jeans for the first time after like a few months and realizing they were like tracksuit pants on me. And I was just like, I just, it was like this morning of like, oh my God, like I actually look disabled now. Cause uh, you know, when you're freshly paralyzed, you still got the fatty legs. And, and I was like, I've got the skinny, skinny legs. And that really upset me and it got me down, but it didn't last long. Like I was like, I knew, it's like, I, I don't know, I just like map everything out and I, I could see that and I'm like, right, to get over that, you have to accept it and you have to almost not hide it. You know how they say like a uh, moment's only embarrassing if you make it, if you're embarrassed, mm. same as with my leg. I knew the only way to overcome that was to actually show them more and be confident in it. So f- again, like a fake it till you make it little process I did, posted about body confidence. I wasn't confident about it. <laughs> I didn't want to show my lip, but it was. It was a fake it till you make it. And I was like, you know what? And then you get to a point where it's like, yeah, now I don't care. Yeah, now, it gives like, a shit, yeah. Yeah, it was, so, and then um, uh, confidence as well, like because I uh, broke up with my ex. So I spent four years single. I was happy single, like traveling, doing my own thing. But then when I was ready to go back into the dating side of things, I realized like my confidence, even though like online, it was like looked amazing. And it was like fine when it came to like signing up to Tinder, I was like, I am so insecure. And I had no idea how insecure my disability was because I, even though I knew my own value and I knew what I could bring to the table, it was now like shit. Am I going to be able to get someone else to see it? without looking past the wheelchair and that was another struggle that I think that was like a big insecurity that took me nearly a year to like slowly build up and I had to do certain things to build that up and 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 how did that did, sounds like you found someone and oh yeah I yeah. found someone that, 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 I found someone so that, that worked was, out but yeah like with the first with the dating and stuff like you know I had to like test and trial and start to figure out like hey boy what, what do I like what do I need from like you could just tell with the way people treat you. For example, being carried up the stairs here, big green flag. Like the fact that a guy's willing to just like uh, pick you up and do it where I'd go out on dates and guys would feel like too scared to touch me. I'm like, okay, this is not (laughs) going to work. work. (laughs) This is not going to work. Like, you're going to need to lift me. Like, so... um, it sounds like a pretty quick filtering process because it's like, well, all right, sweet, move on, move on, move on. the best. And then the ones that, that, that there is that that connection and ease then they get to know the real you who is amazing and then you'd go go from that's there. why i believe authenticity is the biggest thing because yeah. you cut, cut to the chase cut to the chase if you be your true self to me yeah let me pick whether i like you or not and you why would you want to hang out with me if i don't genuinely like it and that's what i did and when i got to the point when i met my current partner partner jesse i actually that's when i was saying about the affirmations i was like i got to a point where i was like dating and i was you know, I'm like, you know what, I'm actually ready to meet someone genuine and like settle down. And I was like, you know what, I've always done affirmations in my head or like, you know, said said stuff in like conversational kind of terms in my head, but I've never actually done the whole look in the mirror, say something out loud. And I was like, you know what, let me give it a try. For one month straight, I only admitted this to my partner like the other week, he didn't know. For one month straight, I said to myself, even if I wasn't looking in the mirror, just to myself out loud, I said stuff like, um, I'm grateful for my family, my dogs, um, you know, just the, the grateful list. And then I said, and if one day I fall in, I said, if, because I didn't want it to be like, life wasn't worth living if you weren't in love. I was like, if, and if, and oh, I forgot what I said. It was so long ago. I said, if I fall in love one day, one day I'm going to be with someone that's going to make it feel like it was worth the wait. I said, I, I butchered that. Beautiful. I don't know what I said. <laughs> But I basically repeated this over and over again and I believed, I had the like the feeling of like, I'm going to feel like I, I, I could actually act the relief of being in a position where I was finally with someone that I knew was worth the wait. And then literally one month later, I met Jesse. That is crazy. Yeah. Like, I've got one question yeah. to that, You've, which is we, we, we've spoken about before. 
It worked. It worked. And you've only done it once. Yeah. Tell me why you're not in the Bahamas with a yacht. I you know what I mean? Like, because it worked that one Perfect. time. I love that question because I know the answer to that for me yes. personally. I don't want it enough. Like, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, this right. sounds yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, 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 of course. But, like, for example, people that want to be really, really rich. Like, um, oh, have you have you heard of Adrian Portelli? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, like, yeah. So, like, I, I know Adrian and I, and I think of him quite often in the sense of, like, he's so successful and he's doing that because he wants it so bad. And I, no offense to Adrian. Like, everyone, each their own. But it's like that saying where they say, like, you know, a billionaire has all these things. But one thing he doesn't have that I have is enough. I think it was on a podcast. I heard that. Or yeah, I heard yeah, that yeah. somewhere. I think it was yeah. on a podcast before. But I was like, and I relate it. That's exactly how I think. When you don't want something bad enough, like personally me, like of course I'd love to go to Bahamas, but it's not my priority. Yeah. My priority is doing other things. I feel like if I had spent all this time to be like, that was my goal, I would do it because everything I have manifested or done affirmations, it actually has happened. But I just, I, uh, it's a tricky one. But like, yeah, I feel like when your life revolves around one certain goal, you, you're going to be successful. And I'm, I'm grateful in a position where I'm, I'm content. I feel so content that I, I don't... And if you wanted to, you'd yeah, do it. If I, yeah, if I, but I admit, yeah. like, Adrian wants money and success so bad that he'll do anything. Well, I'm, I'm, my dad taught, I think, There really it is, there taught, it is, Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy, I'm content. I don't need yeah. as much as I want to, but you know what? I might actually start saying it. <laughs> and we'll check back in, yeah, see if I go to, but not Bahamas, Japan. I really want to go to Japan. Oh, oh, that that leads me into one question. Sorry to jump in, Bryce, because I had this question yep. and Japan just triggered it. What, what are you? You went to all these trips with your dad, with, with with Jim, when and your family when you were younger. What's the one, the, the best memory? What's the best trip that Jim took you on as a family, as a kid that you go back to and you go that that was amazing. Oh, that's a good one because there's so many. Oh, you put me on the spot here. Um, Greece. More for like um, feeling like home because of the culture and stuff like that. And there's always like we went to Greece about three times. But surprisingly enough, I always go back to when I was four, year, four years old when I actually remember America. Uh, for, we went there again when we were 16. But for some reason, the four-year-old memories of dad taking us to Disneyland and mum you know, taking us up the Statue of Liberty. Cause I remember like I had a fight with my teacher at the time. Cause I told her I'd been up on the Statue of Liberty and she's like, you can't go up that. Like you can't even climb. I'm like, yes, you can. And I was like, I was four years old. She goes, you wouldn't even remember. I'm like, I did. And then we Googled it and it was because of 9-11 happened six months later. So they closed oh. the Statue of Liberty. So I was like, I knew I was right. Even though I was four, I actually remember so much of that holiday. Um, I love that. That's yeah. Amazing. It's I, and another thing, like my parents used to get, uh, criticized for were taking us on holidays when we were so young they reckon they had parents comment and say like um you know what's the point they're so young they're not going to remember it and dad would say because it's not the point if they remember or not i'm he's doing you know their job as parents it's giving us joy and like yeah it's just um yeah i can't i can't pinpoint sorry a amsterdam was pretty cool you weren't, you weren't in the cafes. Yeah, we did. We did. Oh, I had my sorry. first asthma attack with my dad. <laughs> I was 16 and I, I had asthma my whole life and I tried to have a job. I was like, I've never had it before. And I was like, oh, we're in Amsterdam. Dad, a 16 year old, dad thought he killed his own daughter. And I had, luckily I had my puffer on me and I, I was fine. It's the only asthma attack I've ever had. But <laughs> So, uh, Christina, I think one of the things that, um, that you make so easy in this conversation is um, to ask some questions that you think might not be um, appropriate to ask someone that's in your circumstances. And I think um, when you went back to purpose and what you're doing and, you know, on your social presence, I think, you know, that, that, that um, desire for you to go, if someone finds themselves in the same circumstances as me, they can come onto my page and see that someone's done it. Um, so... What, what are some of the things that you think that um, would help people um, who are not in your situation better understand people than your situation? Because we, we want to ask, how do you have a relationship? We want to ask, can you feel anything in your toe? Can we, we want to ask if, if, how do you see the world? And, and you've been so open and transparent about that. So what do, you, what do you think would be helpful for a lot of people who don't understand your situation to understand so that not only when they approach you because you're so outgoing, but what about when they um, when they approach P P Podgy, Podgy. Podgy mm. and when they approach someone else who doesn't have that, ha haven't hasn't yet had mm. that modelling from you? 
what are some of the things that people should know about your situation to help those people? With disability or not, I think uh, when I was talking to Dylan Alcott about it, and he says it the best, like never assume. Whether you're disabled or not, do not assume anything about a person. We're all humans at the end mm. of the day. And one thing, I think a big misconception with disability, and I was probably at fault of it too, you just put them straight away in the category. Like they're disabled, they don't work, they have a carer, they like you just, and that's no um, fault to them. It's just like stereotypes, movies don't help, shows every time mm. you see a disabled person, they don't help the stereotypes with that stuff. So my biggest advice would be one, to never assume and two, to just remember that not one person is the same as another person, just like in the able-bodied world. So you, you, you can't also go ahead and like ask people all these questions. Like I'm pretty open to it, but that doesn't mean the next disabled person is going to be like open to asking questions about sex and stuff. So never to assume, but also to educate. Like I educate myself so much through TikTok. If I don't know something or someone says, oh, I've got this disease, I quickly go on TikTok or Google and I search it myself. And I find that having that background, like so we, we all have phones and we all can do research. So if it helps... Uh, get to know a disability without if you and if you don't know if you're going to cross any boundaries well just research it there's resources out there or you'll come across my page where I answer the question <laughs> so I think it's n never to uh, assume because yeah some people take offense to things and some people don't in your experience then just as a general guide do you find um, people um, in your in the community who are affected by you know in wheelchairs and paraplegic do you find that they um would be more likely or less likely to want to talk about what happened to put them in that situation. And again, everyone's individual, mm. but just as a as a guiding principle. I, I feel like if you acquired the injury, like myself, we're like more open to it because something happened. But then again, it could be something traumatic and they don't want to talk about it. And people that are born with disabilities, I don't think would... I don't know. I'm assuming because I don't even know. But I feel like I, from my experience of who I've spoken to, everyone's been open to me, but that might be because I am in a wheelchair. Mm. So they're open to chatting to it or they might get sick of it. Like I, for example, my personal experience at a, like nightclubs or going out socializing, especially with drunk men, and they're like asking the same question. And it's just like, hmm. can someone just like come talk to me about something other than my disability? It's not my, like, don't get me wrong. I'm here talking about it now, but it's not my whole personality. As you guys would know, like, Christina was before the injury like and I feel like the disability isn't our whole p personality and when people just go straight to like talking about it's like you know what if you want to just start with something else first and then get to that yeah I think I think it's I think it's more about just having a sense of what's awkward or what's not mm. what how to how to broach a subject that we don't know enough about and probably having a default where we don't want to upset or say the wrong thing and causes people to yeah and to that's why i was so open because curiosity i get it curiosity like when like i was on the podcast with dylan alcott and when i was in rehab i seen him in a get into a relationship with his uh mrs Chantel, and i was like struck and i'm paralyzed and i'm like how do they have sex Straight away, I'm, like, I'm picturing. I'm like, what? How? What's going on? How do they do it? So you weren't sure yourself no, at the start. No, I'm yeah, paralyzed. Yeah, 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 that's interesting. I'm paralyzed, and that's why people were asking me these questions. I'm like, I am just as curious as you. So <laughs> that's where I feel like uh, Dylan's a bit different from I, because Dylan would say like, he's not interested. He goes, I'm not interested in hearing other people's like disability stories. Like he goes, I don't care how they acquired their disability. Where I feel like I come from that like able-bodied background, so I can understand for you guys sitting here. I already know what you're probably thinking <laughs> and you haven't asked it. I can tell, but um, I come from that background. So it's like, that's why I was like, I'm going to talk about it because you can't find many people that are this open. So I thought, why not give my channel the opportunity to help spread that awareness? Because if you don't know, you're just going to be curious. But if I sit there and say, this is the position we do, or this is how we do it, then it's like that unlock something for you 100 percent. then people just move on right yeah they I mean, just go put the answer question because you I, i'm 45 mm. and i've never had that question answered does that make sense yeah and i've had that question and, and i've said before podgy is one of my best mates he's in the chair and i don't think i've ever asked him i know a few of the other boys have over the years 
Yeah, we we banter, man. We're just mates, yeah. you know. But I've never even asked him. I've sort of asked, thing. and I've asked my mates. I have a quadriplegic mate that can't move his hands. Yeah. gets girls to sit on his face. I have a paralysed mate that t- 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 uh, tells me he grabs on the bed head and does missionary and injects uh, Viagra into. And like, I ask all the questions. Cause I'm genuinely yeah, curious, yeah. and I'm like, I know I can ask it because like it's me. They're, they're gonna tell me anyways. <laughs> But like until these guys told me what they did, like my quadriplegic mate that can't move his hands, I'm like, I just thought there's no action. Yeah. Like that was my assumption. He goes, yeah, no, he gets he gets his girl to sit on his face and he'll lick her out. I'm like, <laughs> good on you. I'm like, that's sick. But like, I just I didn't even know. So until yeah. now that I've heard these stories, I'm like, okay, that's how they do it. That and then now when I look at a person in a wheelchair, I'm like, they're not not getting action. I know they can. And, and you know what? That's that's. It's so cool that you're brave to do that because, again, I'm 45 and I've always had that question mm. swimming around. But for someone like you to get that out, become the norm, the less people walking around, mm. looking at people in wheelchairs and mm. pitying them, thinking that they, they miss out on this or they miss out on that, the better, right? Yeah. And, and the only reason people are looking and making that assumption is because the information to tell them otherwise conditioned over years conditioned that, that yeah yeah that, and that's why yeah. what you're doing is so fucking incredible because it's it is an awkward conversation i even feel awkward now you know but but it's an your, important your ability conversation. to come and control a room yeah it's as soon as you're rocked up you're yeah. like hey have a look at this you're probably thinking how the hell am i driving here today and she's got this little little finger <laughs> yeah. gadget yeah no, i've seen going, podgies yeah i'm going show you now yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. i mean but straight away you're you, no i feel really nearly feel like you're thinking of the other person i do no because even though you might, again, assuming that you would be interested in that, but because of the amount of times people are like, how do you drive? How do you drive? And then when they see it, they're like, cops all the time. They almost forget to breffo me because they're too interested in my hand. <laughs> I use it. I use it. I've had cops turn their camera off and let me go driving disqualified because like of my situation. I just talk my way out of it. <laughs> <laughs> disability card. Um, but yeah, like I, cause, and because of those experiences and knowing the questions that are going to come next, yeah. I almost answer them first. Because I know they were like, it would be interesting. I found it interesting. I'm yeah. just assuming you would have. Yeah, found yeah. It I'd sort of, I've sort of seen Podgy. Podgy's come to our office once or twice, so I sort Kick of understood it. And table tennis <laughs> quiet. And I said, I said, oh, Mike, that's in, that that was he was mad. <laughs> yeah, he was yeah. mad skills. Um, yeah. But I said to the guys downstairs because Christina's going to park out the back, and I'm thinking that none of you guys are going probably going to be a jump jump in and move the car. You know what I mean? Mm. But, oh, no, no, no. You guys can drive it. Yeah, I know, but I wouldn't trust. Where's no, no, no. It's got foot pedals. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that works as well. But I didn't tell the cops that when I was driving disqualified because I had my mates next to me. And they were like, And they oh, were like, how are we going to move no, this car no. if you get out? Yeah, the cops <laughs> like, you're going to need one of your mates to, because I didn't do a uh, medical report. They're like, you're going to need one of your mates to drive your car. And I was like, look, l- legally, <laughs> they can't drive with hand controls. So I can't. And they're like, oh, oh, okay. And then they turn the camera off. Like, we'll go this way. You go that way. I'm like, they could have. I just, they don't know. <laughs> exactly. They assumed. So like, I pull never it. Never assume. Never <laughs> assume. That's a good, that's a that's good thing in, amazing. not just in life, but in oh. business as well. That's a good lesson. So going forward, how do you think you get the, the maximum, um, uh, leverage for your, for your message, Christina? What, you know, you're, you, you're in the public speaking scene. You're, you're active on social media. You've created your YouTube channel. What, how, how would you like to, if, we, if we're having this conversation in five years and you think, well, you manifest, you know what you want, how, how do you get the maximum audience to hear your purpose and um, your message? At the moment, I'm just <laughs> trying to get it across through Instagram. Australia's number one podcast. Yeah, yeah this show's a <laughs> podcast. I actually wanted to do my own podcast because people are like, you'd be great. I'm like, you I could should, talk man. all the time. I'm actually here just scoping everything. <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool, this is what I need. I'm getting all the tips. Nah. But um, I I want to one day. I, this is, again, like a big fear of mine, but like I would love to do like keynote speaking or a podcast, but like I just am too scared. You should do one of those podcasts whoa, 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 like whoa, Theo whoa. Von where you, it's just single person. Where you go in and Theo Vine, did you say? Yeah, Theo Vine. Yeah, how about legend? He's coming to yeah, Australia soon. Did he you see? He's in March. I did see oh, that. I know. Got it. That's a disconnect. We'll go. <laughs> That's a disconnect from your mindset. You're scared to do I, a podcast. Yeah, I know, I know. I know. That doesn't make sense I, to me based on everything <laughs> we've just had a conversation because about. Because exactly, like, uh, who was I listening to? Uh, Vin. Uh, he's a yeah, keynote Vin speaker. Trin, yeah. Who? Um, the Vietnamese speaker. Yeah, yeah Vin. So I, he's from Adelaide. Um, and he said, like, think about your childhood. How many times did you do public speaking? I was captain, SRC, uh, sports. I was all these, like, leaders, things growing up, and I never did a speech. I always avoided it. I got my partner, captain, to always speak. I, I just hated public speaking. 
And then when I was watching one of his speeches and he was saying like, you have to practice, like you have to get out there. And when I think of my childhood, I avoided public speaking. Don't get me wrong, I can talk. I practice on Snapchat and then he got to Instagram and now it's podcast and I practice that. But public speaking, I haven't practiced and I need to like take a bit of my own advice and just like <laughs> you'll get there you'll do it i'll get it but i'm not I've used got to no it doubt. it didn't if my dad walked me to school every day and said you are a great public speaker everything else except drop that <laughs> yeah, no. nugget of wisdom. i think that um i think the public speaking thing for you um here's my advice on public speaking he with the best story wins he or she with the best story wins so um telling the message that you want to land in stories is is really all it is people just love hearing stories yeah and you you already have a you know the 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 premise of why you're here is is a backstory in itself but i think i think there's way more that that people can get from you than how do they how do they um punch back from um you know the resilience required to come back from something like that there's there is just so many things about your mindset and the way that you view the world that so many people could admire. I'm, I'm actually sitting here thinking, what excuses have I got? What, what oh, you know, oh, nice. if, if I've got any limitations, this is certainly helping and Jim, me. And Jim's message as well. I feel like you've got, you've got your own. Mm. You've curated yeah. probably your own over your journey, but then you've got, you know, a, a plethora of, of Jim's lessons that, that now obviously you with the platform. Yeah, well, and I feel like at some point I have to take advantage of it because like you said, with the keynote speaking, like I admired like motivational speakers, like before my injury, I, if I'd watch one, I'd love one. They really stuck to me. But I was like, ah, oh, but I don't have a sad story. Like, you know how like but, yeah, but that's, that, that's your, that's your point of difference now. though. You're I've coming. Got, no, I've yeah, got my well. wheelchair now. So I was like, oh, perfect. Like I've actually got my, not the sad, but you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I've got that story to back but i feel like you're right there in the sense of like i feel like there's so much more behind it that i can give but yeah and it's a different perspective from the sad story though that's why it's not a sad story because it's yes most people get up and tell them yeah it's a moving story coming from a mindset and a perspective that from like you said nothing more than a quiver when when that's all it was was a quiver and from that moment on you know yeah and that's that's a story that I, needs I did. To be I did. I did. My sister said that yeah. about there was like these inspiring like paraplegics and and like they said I don't know it wasn't my sister it was someone else but they said like how's that inspiring they <laughs> I don't want to take away from them but like they're like they going about talking about going into depression and all this stuff and then accepting it and moving on and they're like and you know they said to me I'm like I did that from the start so I feel like it would be a waste to not be able to like at least give people an example of like that it is possible. It is just a different narrative to do it. It's just, yeah, being able to control your mind is like the hardest thing to do. But once you've got it, it is the strongest tool you'll ever have. Mm. Like you take away your brain and you have a brain injury now, like what good is your legs? And how much is Jimmy, Mm. Jimmy, Mm. hey? Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. 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 (laughs) Tell us about the drifting. You've you've, you've got a new adrenaline sport uh, for you. Can you tell us um, what that means for you, how you got into it, what you... um, uh, what you get out of that sport now? So I was obviously riding jet bikes um, and that gave me a, I can't even explain the feeling jumping a bike that high and with that distance, just the adrenaline, adrenaline rush is just unmatched. So when I had my accident, I was like, that was one thing that actually got me down with like going from one of your questions earlier. I was like, shit, how do I accept losing something that I just found for a couple of years. I was only riding probably for three years and now I've lost it because even though I can ride and I did get back and I proved the doctor a point just because I was stubborn, <laughs> got back on the bike four months after my accident just to send him a video. But I was like, it's not the same. It's not the same because it's like, I have to wait for someone to catch me. And it was just like, you can't go as hard. And it was just, I was like, shit, like how am I going to cope? And then a year after, because I was too busy worrying about recovery and being half dead all the time um so when I got invited to go drifting I didn't know what it was other than like like Tokyo drift um I was like oh it sounds good like I, I used to do little legal burnouts in my car um so I was like oh no this would be something that I would do and then I got in and by the first corner that we were drifting I was just like oh my god like this this is, this is the exact same feeling Likewise with the injury with other stuff, like being able to appreciate a moment without physically doing it. Like people don't, you know, say like, are you jealous of your sister being able to walk and stuff? I'm like, I've learned to like appreciate a moment just by feeling it. 
So with like drifting, I was like, oh my God, this is the same feeling. And I could like appreciate how much that made me happy, even though I was a passenger. And I was like, okay, this is enough. I'll do this for a while while I build a drift car. I thought $10,000, six months, I'll have a car done. And it's been three and a half years building a car and 10 times that amount of money (laughs) going into a car. But I knew that was another thing I had in my back pocket. I knew everyone would always be like, you know, like when's the car going to be done? And I knew I was kind of suffering in the sense of like not having a a passion again for five years. Like, like since my injury, I was like, I'm not going to be doing anything and I'm just going to be building this car. But I knew once I got my hands behind the wheel, that five years would be worth it. Like, and I feel like people struggle to be able to, you know, you guys would know as like businessmen, like having to suffer and build up the business just to reap the rewards later. Like I understood that five years was required to be able to, you know, get the benefits from drifting. And uh, it was about, oh, when this podcast releases. Anyways, uh, was recently I went um, drifting for the first time and it was the best thing I've ever done. Like I, I felt like I had the old Christina back, like being able to be behind the wheel being able to endanger myself again. Like, it was just <laughs> unreal. And I, if you guys ever come to Calder Park, I would I'm coming. love to take I'm you I'm coming. Yeah, love to yeah take we're coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. taking bricks too. Yeah, 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 come, yeah. come, come. So, 16? 14. Oh, maybe I think. Uh, oh, we, might, we might be able to. We'll do it on the street. No, we won't. <laughs> dodge we won't, that we we'll dodge the papers. No, no. <laughs> but, yeah. Christina, this has been an amazing chat. Single-handedly, my most inspirational podcast. Absolutely, yeah, amazing, amazing. Hey, can we get into the rapid-fire questions? Yes, go awesome. for it. Awesome. Uh, where do you feel most at home? Dirt tracks or asphalt? Oh, still dirt tracks because I like the full driving and like out bush type of thing. The drifting. The drifting. <laughs> nah, awesome. Which gives you a bigger adrenaline rush? The jumps or giving speeches? Jumps would give me bigger adrenaline rush. The speaking just scares me. It just really scares me. Do your anxiety rush. Yeah, because like I can at least have... Yeah, it's more of an anxiety and stress and I'm not enjoying it while I'm doing a public speaker. Podcast? I do. This mm. is great. What's the difference between podcast and speaking? Because it's a conversation and I don't have... 600 high school students judging me and just staring the at me. Eyes, the beady yeah, eyes. Yeah, and, and at they're you. so quiet. And I'm like, I just feeling so much judgment where when it's a conversation, it's just. Like, you're, you're speaking to millions right now. I, I, I know, biggest podcast in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Which one feels more triumphant, a wheelie or a mic drop? I'm going to say mic drop because I really couldn't really do wheelies. <laughs> in the wheelchair, I can. A little can you do them? In the, in the wheelchair, yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, the mic. <laughs> Um, what do you binge when you watch motocross movies or inspirational talks? Inspirational talks. Definitely. You love them. Yeah. I don't, I honestly don't care about like drifting or motocross. I never studied things. Like I was so just, you like doing I'm, it, I'm not doing watching it. it. Yeah, I like yeah, to yeah, do yeah. it and then listen to stuff that's going to motivate me to keep doing it. Awesome. I'm a bit like that with mm. video games. Like, mm. I don't get doing the bloody snowboarding on the video game. Let's, let's actually go, the real let's go snowboarding. Yeah. yeah. Christina, this has been an awesome chat. Is there anything anything we've missed, anything you want to leave us with? When are you kicking off your inspirational uh, you know, TED Talks? Key and, yeah, key TED talks, talks and all that sort know. of stuff. I'm not too sure. Um, no, I think this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, hopefully, you guys can listen on my own podcast one day now. <laughs> but yeah, no, I've, I'm, yeah, nothing else to add, I don't think. No, it's been amazing. Anything else you want to leave us with, big fella? No, I just think that um, the, the the key takeaway I've got for, is is the left field one. It's it's um, of everything that you shared with us. It's it's the, the Jimmy conversation around planting seeds, mm-hmm. um, and he just said every the, the glass is half full. The glass is half full. Yeah. Bingo. The glass is half full. Yeah. And then when something, you. when something um, <laughs> Well, positively. Positively, yeah, yeah. Mm. So when something major pops up in everyone's life, and let's hope that it um, that it's not the same experience that you had for a lot of people watching this, but um, when something pops up, that's the default that comes into their mind mm. when that happens. That muscle I, memory. I, I yeah. am super resolved to continue to to spread um, positive messages that my kids can lean on when I'm not around when yeah. they leave the nest. So, yeah. um, and it's like that consistency, like you know, if you're trying to lose weight and if you're not going to 
keep at the diet or whatever, you're eventually going to lose them. Dad, I think, had that consistency no matter when or how up. old we are. And even now, if I'm 28 and I have the conversation, he'll still say that same thing. So I feel like I've been on this healthy, positive mindset diet my whole life. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. Thanks for sharing it with us. Yeah. yeah, Christina, and just keep up the good work. Like you're sharing so much, so much good energy and good vibes, and and you know, just even yeah, when you enter a room, it's it's you know, it's just a pleasure to have you in that space. So yeah, just keep that up, keep doing that sort of stuff, and and um, you know, keep working on your platform and getting the message out. I think doing amazing things. And you guys too, with like. I'm not going to pronounce it. Ah, uh, now, now you I'm have the, to. I'm not, I'm, EB, EB. I'm not going to pronounce it. But like, as you were saying, I'm like, if I didn't listen to you guys say it, I didn't even know about it. So you guys have a, you know, a lot of value to give to listeners. And I, I appreciate people that do podcasts because you spend the time to come and talk and actually spread out, you know, positive influence to other people that you don't probably realize need it, but they do. Like I got a lot out of your podcast before coming here when I was studying. <laughs> Christina was binging us. Binging. <laughs> All right, guys, please like, share, subscribe. As you know, 2024, a dollar's going to every subscribe and follow. So get around us. We'll do that. Uh, to our amazing cha- amazing charity, EB. Who's going to say it? Are going to say it for us, Ep- Benny? Ep- no, epidermolosis bullosa. Well done, Ben. Did I get it? Without That's... even looking at notes, mate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, you're I was gonna, under the pump. <laughs> you're going to be the man to say that on each app, but please, uh, please give um, and share and help the awareness get out. It is the worst disease you've never heard of, uh, and it's a skin condition in our most vul- vulnerable in the kids. So please like, share, subscribe. That one should be shared to everyone. Everyone can get heaps out of that. See you at the top. Bye. Woo! can find a better version of themselves if they choose hmm. you just need to go start some shit action is all that matters be a man of your word i think i look back now and i'm like well that took some guts be kind be kind be kind see you at the top new episode every wednesday <laughs>